this multiple crises, and I call it the six-headed crisis. So we have a crisis of climate, we have a crisis of uh, public health pandemic, we have a, a crisis of the loss of biodiversity, we have a crisis of um, social and racial injustice. Uh, the fifth crisis we have is one of um, distrust in international uh, trade and um, democratically established, uh, established institutions. And the sixth, last but not the least, is our um, the faces or the, the sorry the crisis that we face in uh, the financial markets or at least the instability that's currently inherent in uh, our financial in, in our financial markets and our infrastructure. One could imagine as such a uh, economic system then which you know is dealing with the allocation of these scarce resources uh, in such a way that it leads to a sufficient production of goods and services to the benefit of the individual or the private citizen, but in a manner which is healing, caring, regenerative, you know, for all the likes, you know, uh, uh, you know for the employees, uh, the community, uh, the planet, and also uh, the capital stakeholder in the full process. And that, you know, fully embedded by, again, a robust uh, democratic uh, or dem democratically established uh, uh, institutions and elected uh, representatives. By the way, pleasure uh, to be here too, uh, uh, William. So, uh, and thank you for the opportunity. So first of all, uh, if we start, you know, on that question, very, again, um, elementary question, it is a um, foundation for uh, leading and enjoying a decent quality of life, you know, on earth, full stop. So, and uh, if we define uh, economics as somewhat an allocation of scarce resources to uh, produce a certain set of goods to satisfy the needs of uh, the private citizen, I think one can imagine and one can easily see that the organization or the setup or the deployment of that um, uh, system is uh, primordial in terms of the outcome for quality of life of the individual, stability of um, the system, the society, balance of the environment, but also I think to uh, the extent uh, that you know um, um, concerns are being given to uh, people that are on the fringe of society. Um, and so these are also for the people like, you know, the elderly, uh, the deprived, uh, the sick, and uh, the immigrants. So, um, you yeah, know, that's why, you know, economics as such is a very important kind of, uh, or plays a vital role in our society. Yes, yeah, so I, again, I would maybe start off with uh, the, distinction that the, the policy making is making, uh, or is most of the time is actually uh, following the theory. Uh, again, that would in general. So, and I will actually add on with uh, two exceptions that confirm this rule. Um, but if we think back, so um, there it has been recently in the 20th century, unfortunately, uh, what I deem to be a failed attempt uh, on the part of the economics to pursue a quantitative kind of uh, science. And um, so it was actually based on, you know, um, uh, advancing some um, a hypothesis, which was then followed up with some empirical observations. And then from that, you know, you extrapolated a theory in general, but in the process, you were also including some uh, major assumptions uh, about, you know, your, your modeling. Uh, and also you did, you know, by, by doing so, you were extrapolating from a finite kind of sampling of the population. But that aside, I think if we come back to the uh, to this, what I said earlier, I think, you know, the, the theory was always preceding the policy making. If you look in history, and if you look at some major steps, so there was like Plato in the Republic, he already advanced some notions of the required skills, uh, the technique in, in, in Greek. So um, in order to have a stable kind of society, or I think, you know, for, for individuals to enjoy a stable society. If we move forward, then we had maybe in the mid 19th century, we had the classical um, economists, you know, with uh, Ric uh, Ricardo and 
um, the Adam Smith, uh, 1776, of course, Adam, you know, the, uh, on the wealth of nations, whereby mostly uh, both economists actually were advancing the, um, the notions of the benefits of a free market and free trade. And then at the beginning of the 19th century, again, you had another theory which was developed by the Austrian school, uh, again, by epitomized by a very important um, econom uh, sorry, Austrian economist, you know, Friedrich Hayek. And actually he was, uh, you know, um, designing a theory and the first one actually to establish a uh, theoretical concepts about the business cycle, about capital formation, about even a monetary uh, theory. And what was, Interesting about him, this was also the psychology that was incorporated into his, you know, theory, right? Who advanced the importance of uh, motivation, entrepreneurial spirit, um, as those were features that actually were, could be determining the outcome of society, if not the prosperity uh, of that society. And that was actually that theory, you know, that liberal theory was actually um, endorsed by the Chicago School of Economics in the 70s. Uh, by Mil uh, again by uh, uh, advanced by Milton Friedman, and that those were the foundations for the policies. Again, this you, you see that sequence first the theory and then the the, the policy making and the engineering, you know, uh, for you know the um, President Reagan and Thatcher in the UK. Now I said you know that maybe there are two exceptions to that rule, and so these were uh, two major crisis situations. So the first one was in the 1930s you know, where you had this, the, the largest kind of financial collapse or crisis that we've ever faced in history, mm -hmm. and whereby uh, Maynard Keynes actually advanced this uh, general theory on, uh, uh, on money. And so that was, you know, uh, and where it was actually extolling the virtues of deficit, uh, of deficit uh, spending by the government. So this is actually the first time um, that, you know, you had actually the reverse, although, you know, Keynes was actually going back and forth, uh, forward between, you know, uh, designing theory and policymaking. But you had, in the face of this major crisis, you had uh, a, um, uh, the, 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 uh, the policymaking that was actually uh, advancing the, um, somewhat the theory. Now, the second element that we have is in our current crisis is the fact that we, um, um, so we have this multiple crisis, you know, be it climate, you know, health pandemic, or even uh, the one about the financial market instability. I think, you know, we have this crisis moment where we actually have to acknowledge that we are run out of policy uh, uh, or at least, you know, some tools or some instruments. And then as we see, we know we are um, uh, designing and we are writing policy, we're engineering policy that is actually preceding theory, right? So this is another kind of occasion, you know, where because we, we, are, we have been overtaken by the facts, right? And the theory could not keep up with the facts and as such, we have to you know, try and, and keep up with this uh, policy making. Yeah, so we, again, maybe referring back to our first question. So if, if we define, we know what, you know, uh, economics is trying to pursue as a set, you know, faced with, scarcity of resources and it's trying to come up with a certain allocation that fits you know a production of goods and services to benefit you know the primary uh, needs of the uh, the citizen i think you could see that you know again that the way you elaborate on it or the way you actually deploy it is very important uh, as it determines the physical and the emotional well-being of the citizen again it's important for uh, the way uh, you know, you have that stability in your society, you have that uh, balance in your environment, and you can also uh, ensure at least, you know, to what extent you are making assurances for the people that are deprived and that maybe uh, live on the fringes of society. Um, so, but, you know, to the second part of your question, the commons, the commons actually feature um, hardly in any of uh, the context. So if we define, again, commons, uh, I would define commons as your access to clean water, clean soil, and clean air um, in, in essence. So there is also, by extension, you could also talk about the, the justice uh, system within that uh, as a public good. And also health as, as you know, could also by extension be considered the, those of the commons. But in, in, I would come back on these three elements, clean air, clean soil, and clean, uh, clean air. Um, so that is you know, um, in, in, it has not featured a lot in theory. It has not featured in, in, in even in our policy making. 
And you could wonder why, why would that be? Why would it, it that we make so much abs uh, abstraction of these commons? It is because commons don't have a voice. They don't have a representation. We uh, actually use our commons for short-term profits. So we extrapolate these primary resources, you know, without any um, consideration again for the access on this clean air and clean soil and clean water. You know, just think of fracking, you know, where all the implications are for, you know, our commons just as a quick example. It's also the short term, you know, uh, over the intergenerational kind of considerations. So in our sheer blind pursuit of profit, we actually make full abstraction of, you know, the value of commons. It's also indicative that the Nobel, that only, you know, the first Nobel had been awarded um, to uh, Eleanor Ostrom in 2008, right? So, and that was a person who actually did a lot of research on the commons. And prior to that, even, you know, 15 or more Nobel uh, mandates had been awarded to uh, members of the Chicago School of Economics. And there is hardly any mention of commons in their works. Yeah, so I would actually, um, coming back, so I referred earlier um, to the extent that our current economics or our current system actually uh, is faced with, you know, this multiple crisis, and I call it the six-headed crisis. So we have a crisis of climate, we have a crisis of uh, public health pandemic, we have a, a crisis of the loss of biodiversity, we have a crisis of um, social and racial injustice. Uh, the fifth crisis we have is one of um, distrust in international uh, trade and um, democratically established, uh, established institutions. And the sixth, last but not the least, is our, um, the faces, or the, the, sorry, the crisis that we face in uh, the financial markets, or at least the instability that's currently inherent in, uh, our, financial, in, in our financial markets and our infrastructure. So if we look at each of those crises, we can actually then compare to what extent our economics actually addressed or sufficiently addressed or neglected those outcomes, right? So we can take, let's you know, take example of uh, the biodiversity. So the biodiversity is an outcome that we have seen since 19, or so since 1945, you know, the outcome uh, after the outcome of the Second World War, we have actually pursued a uh, economic system with full disregard of our uh, nature or uh, with re regard our, uh, of our bio uh, ecosystem. So there is an, a total absence of, you know, uh, making our economic system, you know, nature centric. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at climate, you know, the outcome of our climate, again, for the same area outcome from the uh, Second World War, there has been a uh, full pursuit of growth that was actually backed by the uh, extraction of oil and gas. And this, uh, this extraction took place uh, with an externality, an outcome. So the, the carbon dioxide or the greenhouse gas that actually, you know, was an outcome of that pursuit. Yet we failed overall, notwithstanding that we had the knowledge, we had the scientific knowledge, we failed to incorporate that externality into our overall allocation process, you know, of you know, the way we allocated capital and the way we allocated that capital in a price uh, or I would say a carbon agnostic uh, price allocation uh, system. Now, if we take, you know, um, the, the, the other element we have, for example, the social and racial injustice. The social injustice, I would say, you know, is also the fact, for example, that trade unions have no longer any say. So the power of the trade unions, and to some extent that was usurped, I think, you know, that's also, you know, fair to, to, to say, but in, in essence, the individual um, employee has no longer representation by a larger group or a group that is actually representing the interest of that employee. With respect to racial injustice, we have seen that there has been a weaponization uh, of uh, the, um, the police force with somewhat you know, indiscriminate kind of force being applied to minorities. Right? So these are, um, we've also, when we look back at the public health pandemic, uh, we have seen in the run-up to the uh, public pandemic, so of um, you know, five years prior, that they have that the big pharma have actually undertaken more share buybacks, more dividend payouts to shareholders than they've actually spent on R&D, right? So in R&D, including notwithstanding we have had the issues, the warnings about 
uh, forthcoming pandemics. So, but yet we, we still saw these outcomes. So these are some examples where you see that this, there's been this um, disconnect between the outcomes that we're currently faced with in the forms of the six-headed crisis and the fact that we fail to address them in a fundamental or a systematic manner in our economic setup. Yeah, this, this may be a very uh, tough one. Uh, again, given the preponderance of uh, spin doctors, um, all are not you know, represented like in a uh, Netflix series as Borgen. So, but we see more, more and more the emergence of spin doctors. So these are the people that actually advise you know, elected officials. So I would make the case that there would be actually to parliament disclosures made by spin doctors that there is no explicit or there's an absent or explicit absence of conflict of interest on the subject matter that is, uh, you know, they're advising upon. Um, yet the, um, there's an example, for example, in the movie, uh, excellent um, Oscar winning documentary, uh, The Inside Job mm -hmm. by uh, Ferguson. So um, director Ferguson. And there is a case, you know, they're focusing in on Iceland and how Iceland actually became, fell prey to the um, uh, outcomes of the 2008 financial crisis. And before in 2006, I think it was, there was a book, uh, a booklet written about, you know, the appeal of Iceland as an investment uh, destination. And uh, as it happens, that book was written by some Columbia Business School economists. And that uh, booklet actually was commissioned by the local chamber of commerce. Yet, you know, nowhere uh, was there to be seen that actually that there was paid research or it was like a paid or commissioned uh, for and paid for by this uh, uh, local uh, chamber of commerce. So there was, you know, a very blatant uh, conflict of interest, which was not made, made apparent. Right? So um, again, this is, you know, hence the importance of those disclosures, but ultimately I would actually uh, postulate that it is you know, down to the, uh, uh, that the, the, the accountability should be held by the intellectual uh, individuals, right? So it is those people that actually select their spin doctors or select the advice of economists, you know, in order to come up with their policy decisions. And it's ultimately eventually them uh, who should be held accountable. Yeah, this is a very uh, interesting question and it's also a very um, a challenging question. So if we look at, um, maybe if you allow me to uh, deal with um, the second part of your uh, questions first. So capitalism, how would we define capitalism? Um, so maybe in an elaborate manner so, and try to capture all the elements, it's uh, the economic system um, fundamentally actually based on extraction of uh, finite primary resources, uh, it is facilitated by um, you know a, multi, a money printing pr uh, you know privilege of the financial institutions, and um, it is also um, looking for it's focused on this optimal allocation between private capital and uh, hired labor, um, with a view to maximize right the maximization. So the growth pursuit is very important here of goods and services to, uh, again, also maximize the returns to uh, shareholders. In this overall process, it's actually paying scant regard to the outcomes to uh, alike, I would say, the um, employees, you know, the uh, communities and the environment. And we can see this represented by, with respect to employees, the uh, alienation of the workforce, right? Again, uh, you know, by the hidden, uh, epidemic of mental uh, illnesses, and of course, by the, de uh, the deprivation of our environment as we currently see in the climate calamities we're faced with. So that's, you know, the definition, again, very expansive definition of capitalism. <clears throat> and um, now coming back to your first question, so to what extent does it actually explain, does, you know, do economics explain our capitalist system? And I would say they do so partially and on the surface. Right. So they're very good at explaining maybe the supply and demand dynamic, maybe some price issues. But what it is failing to actually unearth uh, currently are uh, some of the elements which might be too intricate. Right. So an element of too intricacy might be, as I already referred to, 
It's uh, not very well understood till this day, the money printing privilege of financial institutions in this duopoly with central banks. I would also say um, not very well understood with respect to in the US, a federal court decision, you know, which called Citizen United mm. in 2010, which allowed major corporations and wealthy donors uh, to actually uh, participate in unlimited, unlimited, you know, uh, political party funding. And that, you know, again, to the detriment of the individual uh, private citizen. It might be have to do with the fact also in respect to elements that are invisible. Again, I've already alluded to the carbon um, dioxide externality element, but there is also the injustice, which is not, you know, coming to the fore, you know, to the front of the analysis of our current economics. It might have to do with the depravity. I think, you know, again, these are elements that are not very well, you know, uh, researched or not, you know, extensively researched by our current economics or explained at least by our economics. There's also the hidden aspect to it. If you think about the outcome of the mental uh, illness, our uh, propensity, or at least if you look at the number of people that are currently addicted to opioids, currently uh, both in the US and in Europe, the addiction, uh, and again, the hidden of a hidden nature to um, antidepressants, anti-anxiety, uh, sleeping pills, right? So. Um, these are uh, outcomes. And the last one I would say, even our current economics is not very good because we sweep it under the carpet is in the way we actually deal with the, um, um, some of the, the stories that, what I would call the decoy stories told by uh, the lobby sector. And of course, you know, the major uh, tax optimization slash uh, evasion schemes, again, to the benefit of uh, the uh, big corporations and, and, and wealthy uh, individuals. So again, so, Economics very good at explaining the surface of it, but you know I think it's doing a dismal job at <laughs> looking at you know the all the trends and influences and the developments underneath that surface. Yeah, I think you know your question. I would actually pose your question in the past tense because. Capitalism, in my view, has actually ended with uh, the 2007-2008 uh, financial crisis. You know, and why do I make that statement? Uh, you only have to look at the current magnitude of the four major uh, central bank balance sheets. Right? So you have at the moment, they represent $30 trillion. So which is about 30,000 billion of dollars of money mostly has been printed by these central banks have been injected into the economy to stabilize in the first, in the case of 2007, 2008, financial markets and avoid uh, major systemic risk. And secondly, you know, address the issues of the global health pandemic, right? So these are elements in order to mitigate the outcomes of those. Um, in that process, I think we have been, or the, the, you know, the central banks have actually been artificially inflating the value of the stock market in, this year alone, I think, you know, uh, we had for the S&P 500, 54 breaches of record, right? So there are only 250 working days, right? And in this market, you know, where we are facing six crises at the same time, we had 54 breaches of S&P 500. Uh, on the other side, you know, we also have in the real estate market, again, in the US, but also for uh, other parts, uh, you know, on um, continental Europe, we have seen price momentum that's akin to what we have seen in the 2006 uh, market. Again, you know, uh, bringing us back to the subprime mortgage uh, uh, collapse that uh, ensued from that process. Mm -hmm. So from that, you know, you can stay to the capitalist element. The um, central bank has become the price setter, the market maker or the sole market maker for government securities and for treasuries. You know, even one could make that same statement you know, for large um, segments of the corporate bonds. So they are currently, so this is a government institution which are setting the price and of which all other prices are being uh, derived, right? So uh, that is a major element right now. So is again, why I'm backing up that statement, why we don't have that capitalist system anymore um, and why capitalism in its, you know, essential form and original form has actually, you know, um, uh, does no longer exist. Coming back on that, so um, you also have these unintended consequences. 
uh, right now we have a younger generation who can't access the real estate market. They have to wait the upcoming or the imminent wealth transfer of their parents for them to actually have access or avail access to that real estate market. Right? It's not a healthy proposition to having to uh, actually await uh, the outcomes of the life outcomes of your parents for you to have access to a real estate market. On the other side, if you look um, for the elderly, the pensioners, a lot of their holdings, fixed income holders, you know, barely uh, contribute to uh, or barely complement to their pension schemes or their pension uh, income because the yields are, you know, artificially low as a result of this quantitative easing. So this money printing by these uh, four major central banks, you know, have actually uh, collapsed yields and as such, you know, led to a um, detrimental level of income for the pensioners. So this is a bit, you know, why my, my statement that, you know, capitalism ended, you know, in 2006 or 2007 and 2008. Um, capitalism in its original uh, format is maybe the least bad of all systems out there. I think that's something that, you know, we might have to acknowledge again, um, but we, we can always uh, wait to be surprised. But if we, so we define that outcome, we know we acknowledge that the fact, but, you know, when I say in its authentic or original format, you know, it has been, uh, there have been some bending of the rules and there have been some, what I would call also the uh, assertion of the system, the capitalist system, by what I would call, quote unquote, evil genius, right? Mm. So, um, and in that regard, so if we look at it, so the bending of the rules of what did that consist, right? So in many, many ways, so we could start off with, um, we allowed, uh, or we made, as of 1982, we made share buybacks, uh, legal again. So prior to 1982, it was illegal to undertake share buybacks because it was considered market manipulation. Nowadays, there's a major constituent of the way our capitalist quote unquote system works is by the share buybacks, right? So that's a system. And, you know, uh, we make full igno uh, ignorance on, you know, the impact it has on share prices. And of course, by extension on the managerial compensation of you know, the C-suites, which are undertaking those share buybacks. Um, we also, if we look at um, the way we actually uh, have actually um, uh, dismantled uh, Glass-Steagall in 19, uh, so the, this is the 1933 act, you know, again, as a outcome of the, the last, the, the, the largest financial crisis in history. So in 1999, um, we had this uh, Glass-Steagall Act uh, dismantled under the democratic regime of Clinton. And um, so what it allowed for is the merging and the fusing of uh, risky investment banking operations along with what I would call traditional non-risky commercial banking. And that fusing has left to a very complex um, financial system, also in the aggregation of the importance of the financial industry, enormous amount of uh, concentration of power. But more importantly, we have in that process also introduced moral hazard, right? So the moral hazard notion is the fact that the C-suite is now taking financial risks in a uh, very, you know, dense kind of power uh, concentration and knowing that the central bank has their back. Right. So this is that notion of the, the that moral hazard that you know the you know, the central bank will actually intervene in case uh, if things go wrong. We also have the elements uh, as already before you know uh, said before. It, this is you know not understandable as we as an evolving human species that we have not taken uh, much more care of our commons. Right, we've said before, you know the commons access to clean air, clean soil, and clean water. We have actually in our economic setup, we have that, you know, completely disregarded. We didn't price for it. We didn't regulate for it. And it was all um, to the benefit of our short-term profits. Talking about short-term profits, we also have at the same time, we are embracing short-termism, right? Whether, you know, it is the quarterly reporting cycle or whether it's, you know, high frequency trading. Um, again, to the detriment of more intergenerational thinking. So if we think, you know, um, our ancestral 
forefathers, you know, had, you know, were always looking when they took a decision, what is the impact on four to five generations down the line? We are taking decisions, you know, at best with a three month time horizon, right? So because we know we have this quarterly uh, reporting cycle, you know, which is uh, taken as a, uh, a benchmark. Um, we also have this uh, conflict of interest, you know, which is rampant. We, you know, as I said, there is uh, the conflict of interest where we see, um, for example, FDA and Big Pharma. So we have uh, members of Big Pharma actually taking seats in the FDA. And after a while, they go back after their term, they go back to Big Pharma. So there is no actually very explicit uh, separation of responsibility, but also of representation in those structures, uh, ensuring that, you know, public health is, you know, coming to the forefront and to the benefit of our, uh, the private citizen. I would come back maybe as a last element, also as a democratically, um, uh, as part of the democracy, because it's also very important that you do have an economic, an, sorry, an economic system, which is embedded in a very robust democratically institutions, is the, the reference made earlier uh, to Citizen United, whereby again, you have uh, the big donors, uh, big corporations and wealthy individuals who can outfund, who could outpace, you know, the private, uh, you know, uh, citizen. And again, that will, you know, translate itself to the fact that his voice or the, the voice of the private citizen will, you know, will hardly be heard or be represented in this overall decision process. So coming back then, so if we know what all these flaws are, we do acknowledge that maybe the capitalist system is the, la the, the least bad of all the other systems. And yet uh, by this, you know, what I would call um, very um, short description or crisp uh, description or enumeration of flaws, you know, we should be able to address those, uh, the, the flaws to actually to pr improve the outcomes. And one could imagine as such, a uh, economic system then which you know is dealing with the allocation of these scarce resources uh, in such a way that it leads to a sufficient production of goods and services to the benefit of the individual or the private citizen but in a manner which is healing caring regenerative you know for all the likes you know uh, uh, you know for the employees uh, the community uh, the planet and also uh, the capital stakeholder in the full process. And that, you know, fully embedded by, again, a robust uh, democratic uh, or dem democratically established uh, uh, institutions and elected uh, representatives. Mm -hmm.